Um, and so instead of starting with the example of what to do, we started with the example of what not to do. Uh, we looked at Solomon, um, who started off good, started off being raised up, uh, raising up the temple, a place of worship for God, really doing some incredible things for God, and then becoming very self-reliant, um, very um, involved in building up his own kingdom. kingdom. We saw him with his concubines and his wives and all these different things. Um, and he kind of forgot about God. Um, we didn't talk about this as much, but it's reflective in his writings. When you look at Proverbs, when you look at Ecclesiastes, which we're not sure whether or not we're with that, but it's about him, we know that. Um, when we look at different things, we very much see that he is even warning his children to remember God. Um, he he kind of comes to the end of his life and realizes he's dropped the ball. Um, but today we're going to look at, I think, one of the most underrated characters in the Bible. Honestly. Um, and I didn't think that before I was studying out this passage, before I was really looking at him. Um, but after looking at him and really looking at his character, I was like, I can't believe that I don't have five times in this passage regularly. Um, there's, it was actually really hard to simmer this down into one lesson, because I was like, there's so much here in just three chapters of the Bible. We're going to look at King Asa. Mm. Um, and there's, it's three, it's Second Chronicles 14 through 16, and it's just packed full of things to learn. Um, he's one of the, like, best-reviewed kings. Um, Chronicles isn't really nice to kings. The kings kind of messed up a lot. Um, God warned Israel about kings, and they said, you don't need a king. They insisted, and, they, and just like God kind of predicted over and over again, uh, because they weren't being led by a perfect God, they were being led by imperfect people, they dropped the ball. But King Asa is reviewed very well. Um, he, he really went all in for God. And it says that he served God his entire life um, with, uh, with his whole heart. Was he perfect? Did he mess up? Yes. And we're going to take a look at that as well today. Uh, but we're really going to take a look at his life and see what we can learn about being all in for God. All right. Um, the title of our lesson today is The Secret to Success. Um, and I think we're going to learn a lot about what success is and even what sex is success can be with God. Last week we got a sports analogy. I am not a sports person. Sue me. I, I was raised in a house where sports were everything. Like literally, I would go into my dad's room to watch TV because he had cable in his room. So I would the cable. And the way he would know is I forgot to turn the channel back to ESPN. Like that. Like he turned the TV on and it'd be on some other channel and he's like, this is were you in my room? And of course I would lie. No. I only watch ESPN. What are you doing? I am a nerd to my core. Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, the works. And so you're gonna get a nerdy reference from me. Uh, so what person I went all in both for God and for the fantasy world is Jericho. Um, he wrote arguably the most immersive fantasy world next to Ari Salvatore. Um, that the world has ever seen. He wrote cultures, languages, worlds into existence. But he also wrote incredible books for God. Um, incredible man to me. He has this book that I think is incredibly inspiring and relative um, to what we're going to talk about today. And what he says is no half-heartedness and no worldly fear must turn us aside from following the light of such and unflinching. This is reflected in his writing. Um, Gandalf over and over again in the Lord of the Rings reminds um, Frodo that there's hope and that we have to cling to that. Um, it's, the whole, it's the whole story. It's incredible. It's powerful. Um, if you haven't watched it, shame on you. <laughs> we'll have a movie very fun. Um, but um, I think we really see that in Asa's life. And so we're going to start with scripture. It's going to be a lot of scripture today. I think it's all valuable. Um, 
I think it's powerful. So if you guys can turn to Second Chronicles 14, we're going to go ahead and get started. And Abiha rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of Abishah. Sorry. Rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. Asa, his son, succeeded him as king, and in his days, the country was at peace for ten years. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He removed the foreign altars in the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. Asherah. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and to obey his laws and commands. He removed the high places and the incense altars in every town in Judah, and the kingdom was at peace under him. He built up the fortified cities of Judah since the land was at peace. No one was at war with him during those years, for the Lord gave him rest. Let us build up these towns, he said to Judah, and put walls around them with towers, gates, and bars. The land is still ours, because we have sought the Lord our God. We sought him, and he has given us rest on every side. So they built and prosper. Asa had an army of 300,000 men from Judah, equipped with large shields and with spears, and 280,000 from Benjamin, armed with small shields and with bows. All these were brave fighting men. Zerah, the Cushite, marched out against them with an army of thousands upon thousands. Some translations say a thousand thousands, a million. And 300 chariots came as far as Beresha. Asa went out to meet him, and they took up battle positions in the valley of the Zephathah, near Moresha. Then Asa called to the Lord his God. I forgot where it ended. Then Asa called to the Lord his God, and the Lord, and said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, Lord, Lord our God, for we rely on you, and in your name we Come against this vast army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere mortals rebel against you. The Lord struck down the Cushites before Asa and Judah. The Cushites fled, and Asa and his army pursued them as far as Jerusalem. Such a great number of Cushites fell that they could not recover. They were crushed before the Lord and his forces. The men of Judah carried off a large amount of plunder. They destroyed all the villages around the Lord, for the terror of the Lord had fallen on them. They looted all these villages, since there was much plunder there. They also attacked the camps of the herders and carried off droves of sheep and goats and camels. And then they returned to Jerusalem. Guys, it's so cool seeing the way that God defends his people. A little bit of background information. So Asa's rule was from about 913, 910 to 873, 869 BC. It's a 41-year reign. Pretty long reign for a king. He's the fifth king in David's line. So he's in the line of David, the third king of Judah. Judah separate, or Israel separated into Judah and Benjamin and all the other tribes. This was he was described as doing what was good in the Lord's eyes. And I think that's something to remember. Why? What did he do that was so pleasing to God? What did he do? It wasn't the war, because he was described as that before. He was given 10 years of peace before this war. It's because he put God first. It's very clear that honoring God, the people of God honoring God, was important in him. And he put that into action. He removed idols. We're not going to have none of that under me. He made that clear. He destroyed their places of worship. When the Bible says high places, those are places that would have gone to worship idols. I didn't know that. I like, had to go look that up, so a little bit of background information. Like the high places, what does that mean? These are places they would have gone to lift up God, to lift up these false gods, to worship in this place. He smashed their sacred stones in the places that they would have seen as sacred to these gods, the things that they would have said that's uplifting or even claiming of certain areas to these gods. He cut down the poles of ash. Now, once again, didn't know who that was before this sermon, so a little bit of background. This was the god that Jezebel worshipped. This was a, uh, one of the many cases of Baal. Uh, it was all about like really celebrating the feminine, which to a degree is very good. 
but it was to a point where it was, it was that the feminine is God. The feminine is to be worshipped. The feminine, and I put it in this place where you would see things like prostitution, you would see things like orgies, you would see things like fertility rights, things like that, all pulling honor from God. This wasn't honoring the woman in God's image, this was honoring the woman separate from God. It was dangerous. He called them to seek and obey the Lord, which was something that his, his, his father did not do. He called them back to the laws that he knew to be righteous, and he held them accountable to them. But he personally stopped that. And because of that, he was rewarded with peace. Now this, we think of 10 years of peace, and like, so what, you know, 10 years without a war, that's not going to be whatever. During this time, that was not common. Like, that was not a thing that happened. You were constantly at war. You were constantly defending yourself. You were constantly, I mean, you read through David, especially with Israel, they were surrounded by their enemies and were constantly defending in some way, shape, or form. That's huge. And during this time, he still honored God. He decided to rebuild God's cities, to rebuild the people of God. Why? Not because we need to be ready, but because these are God's lands, he said. It's such a, it's this beautiful, beautiful representation of what it looks like to put God first. It's powerful. But the 10 years didn't last forever, obviously. And he faces this army. First of all, he's got 580,000 men. That's not a small army. Um, sorry, I'm bad at that. Um, 580,000. That's not like, that's pretty big. He's doing pretty good. One of the things that stands out to me in his prayer is he still refers to himself as powerless. With his 580,000 men, he still comes and he said, only you are able to protect the powerless. He doesn't, he's not relying on himself here. He's not trying to strategize and figure out if we put them in here, if we do this here, and if we put this angle. He comes to this place of, no, God. First and foremost. This showdown, so he's going up against a thousand men, or a million men. So it is a bigger army. To me, this showdown is with Gideon and his 300, uh, with his 300, David and Goliath, the Spartan 300, once again, I'm a nerd, so it's got to be thrown away. This is big, right? Like, this is huge. But his response honestly looks really unintuitive. He goes out, seemingly without a strategy, honestly. Like, he's like, we're going to go out with these men, this million man army with our 580,000. We're going to go out. He personally engages. He leads them. He's at the forefront. He's there. Asa went out to meet him, it says. He puts himself in the fight, and he puts himself in a position where the only way out of this is for God to move. That takes faith. That takes a trust in God. He also prays. And this is the powerful part. And I'm going to read it again. It says, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the many. Help us, Lord our God, for we rely on you. And in your name, we have come against this vast army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let more mere, more, mere mortals prevail against you. This is short. This, what does it take? Two seconds to pray? It's a short prayer, but it's packed. One, it's humble. It's incredibly humble. We are powerless. I don't know if I would have said that. I would have been like, we're overwhelmed, there's more of them. He's like, I have nothing without you. Like, there's no chance without you here. I don't know if I, like, naturally, that's not, I start counting my resources. That's my natural place. Okay, this is where we are, I assess. I only have 580,000 men. I may have said that. But to, to put myself in a place of I'm powerless without you, God, that's humble. We rely on you. 
trust, it's this trust in God that if you don't show up, I'm not going to be able to do this. This is John 15, y'all. This is remaining in the vine. This is, apart from you, I can do nothing. This is beautiful. He also channels his, his, his great great granddad a little bit here. And he says, We come against you, we come against this army in your name. That's David and Goliath right there, y'all. That's in, you, in your name, I will, in God's name, I will conquer today. But it's also about God. And that's what I didn't catch the first time reading through this, I didn't catch the second time reading through this. I, I, I kind of had to go back and meditate on it to see that he's like, you are our God. Do not let these mere mortals prevail. Don't let them embarrass you. Don't let them be able to go back to their villages and say, I guess the God of Israel isn't that powerful. This is about, like, this, he's in this prayer, this is about God. Like he's like, his heart is so in. And I think this combination, this prayer, this personal engagement, this faithful expectation of God's move, this is what it looks like to be on. This is what it looks like to be like, my chips are on the table, what you gonna do about it? It's hard, though. This is a terrifying situation. Can you imagine? I can't even think of what a million people looks like in my head, but to think about facing a million people and looking out on them and to have this heart, it's incredible. But what we see is that God derives the glory from it. God derives this power from it that is incredibly humbling. Because over and over again in this passage, it's and he went up against them and the Lord conquered and the Lord brought it. But even following it, they come back and they make they, out of the out of their hunger, they make sacrifices. It wasn't we're doing this for us. Let, let's get back what God has given to us. His reliance on God in crisis brought them both victory, success, but it also brought glory to God. And I think as Christians, as disciples, that's what we want to do every day of our lives. Yeah. This, is, this is the other part of it. When you're not relying on God, you get it. It's possible, I don't know. I mean, we've seen some crazy stories of wars. I mean, we think of the, the things that happen even just in our own civil war with being outnumbered. It's, po it's probably possible that he could have pulled something off of these 580,000 men. But because he decided to be reliant on God, God gets the glory. This isn't a credit to Joseph. No honor will see the after effective. The Spirit of God came on Azariah, son of Odin. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me. Asa and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. You read on in this passage, it goes on and it shows the history of Israel. He talks about the history of Israel. He talks about how Israel has been conquered, Israel has been through hard times, etc. But because of your faith, God is honored. John 9, verse 7 says, But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. When Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Azariah, son of Oded, the prophet, he took courage, he removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin. Once again, you can read this entire passage. But it goes on to show all the actions he takes in following this. And there was no more war until the 35th year of Asa's reign. This is the secret to success, guys. This is my, my honestly, most of my points here. But true success hinges. True success hinges on our seeking God and remaining wholehearted and in the community. I want to get back to true success in here. I think often we can redefine what success is in our own ways and not in God's ways. And we set ourselves up for failure 
can we honestly oftentimes short ourselves? As we'll see later in this passage, as to what success actually is. This is a cool prophecy. It honestly sounds a lot like a lot of what, when we talk to people about what seeking God looks like. It sounds like a lot of those passages that we use this passage to talk to people about what God, what seeking God looks like. But he says, when you seek him, you will find him. It's a promise. He's with you when you are with him. It's a promise. When you forsake him, you will forsake him. And that can feel really harsh. To me, I read that and I was like, that's not my God, surely. My God is gracious and loving, but my God is also just. And he needs me to walk with him. Or he wants me to walk with him. I need to walk with him. That's what that is. Our relationship with God is dynamic. And it's powerfully dynamic. It's, I mean, we see here, when you walk with him, what can happen? We've all seen it. We've all had those times of highs where we're walking down and like, oh my gosh, all this is going on, but I still have joy, I still have peace. And then we have the time where we walk and we're kind of relying on ourselves. It's, it's a powerful reminder though. And it's mostly positive. A little bit over here. But I think it was needed as we see what happens later. It's attractive. 
it's peaceful, it's joyous. They were like, this place has had peace for 25 years. There is nowhere else that is like that. This place is wealthy, this place is taken care of. Their cities are fortified. God had provided in an incredible way for Judah. And that was attractive to people. And it sent these kings into Canaan. And so they're like, we need to do something. How did Asa respond? It's a little different. First of all, he doesn't even gather his own notes. Like he, he's, he, it's very obvious that he doesn't see this as his big control. He's not worried about it. He's not engaged personally. He's not putting his own skin in the game. He's putting his, like he's even relying on his past. Literally using the store, the money that they've taken from this past victory to fund this new treaty. What's worthy of noting is technically he got people. He got people, right? He, this got alleviated, the treaty got broken, this king didn't have the forces to attack, and he moved on. Technically he got what he wanted. But did he get what he could have gotten? confident as a king, probably, too, at this point. He knew the politics. He knew how to handle things. He knew how to talk to people. He was like, oh, I knew this. This king is worried about money. If I give him money, he's not going to follow through on this treaty. He's a little, he, he knows the game a little bit better. He doesn't even talk to God about it. There's not a prayer in this passage. He doesn't get advice. It, like, it's completely different. Instead of relying on action, God, he resorts to a reliance on money, personal wisdom, politics, and people. That's not the point of the ones. He uses the money he won in the war, the blessings of God's victory, and gives them away. seems to have forgotten the lesson and the warning that he got 25 years earlier. He seems to have forgotten God. Two things happen when we don't go with God. Probably a lot more, but two main One, worldly fixes and hacks seem to push problems down the road rather than bring enduring success. He gets more for the rest of his life out of this. He alleviates one battle moves on to over and over more. He missed out on an opportunity to see God in an incredible way. The seer makes that perfectly clear. She says, did not God deliver this million man army to you? Because you have relied on yourself, on the king of Aaron. This army has escaped your hand. And you could have had more in your stores than you have less. You could have had peace for even longer and not even less. If, when we redefine success in our own eyes, and we don't even consult God on it, we shortchange ourselves often. But I think the bigger thing that happens when we don't go all in for God is where our self reliance leads us. Self reliance starts a domino effect of more sin. And we see this here. He got mad at the correction. He's ups, like he gets upset. He ends up oppressing people in his kingdom. My suspicion is that these king, these people supported the seer. It's not written here, but that's kind of like that's the only thing that makes sense to me when I read this passage. Like, why would he oppress some people? They probably were like, we could have had peace, dummy. Like, <laughs> and he's like, you're going to prison too. <laughs> he's, he's, done. But he even carried this self-reliance into his private. There's a shame that I've personally experienced that comes when we know we're not handling things the way God wants us to. 
And so when he gets in, he doesn't pray to God. When the wars come, he doesn't pray to God. When the seer challenges him, he's not. There is, it's a snowball effect. Asa was a good man overall. That's what it says about him. It says Asa's heart in 15, in 15 verse 7. It says Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord. He messed up. And that one mess up created, and his refusal to be humble to that one mess up created a snowball effect that lasted until his grave. This happens today. Straight up. This happens to individuals. This happens to children. This happens to me in my life. There are so many distractions on a daily basis, so many obstacles on a daily basis, that I have to make a personal choice. Or who am I going to go all the way? Or am I going to be one foot in, one foot out? Am I going to serve two masters? Am I going to rely on and be in God? Or am I going to rely on God? I'm not going to put myself in the full submission. Here's just a couple of things. I had to end with an ellipse, so I was like, on and on and on we can go. But a couple of examples of things that I can struggle with, choosing to be, go all in for God, is my personal goals, personal projects, things that I want to see done, my health issues. This has hit home for me really big recently. Life decisions, how I live. Down to even just contribution, where I spend my money. Facing crises, financial setbacks. Guys, recently I've, I've had a slew of health issues. Moving to a new city, slew of health issues. Not really having relationships where I want them to be. Setting goals and, and projects for a new ministry that I'm a part of. And it's been a wrestle. I'm grateful to have people like James in my life. I'm grateful to have people like Sam. I'm grateful to have people like Sam. Who, people like Matt, who will challenge me and go, like, I don't think you're all in here. Pearls, treasures, gold. He talks about the kingdom of God seeking him. 
Now there's grace here. We all fall short. Lord knows I fall short. But what would this look like for us? Like take a second this week while you're having your quiet time, while you're praying, while you're thinking of what it would look like. If how your life would look different, how this church would look different, how this city would look different. We decided to go all in. We decided to be wholeheartedly committed. How would that change your relationship with your neighbors? How would that change your relationship with your coworkers? How would that change your relationship with your roommate? How would that change your marriage? How would that change your parenting? How would that change? Guys, I know for me it would revolutionize. So I'll leave you with a couple of next steps. One, take a different approach to the trials and crises in your life. I think oftentimes I can kind of show up to God and be like, so what are you going to do? As opposed to having a faithful expectation that people will move. As having a knowledge and assurance and a trust that my God desires to protect and provide for me. Take personal action. Put skin in the game. If you want to see community in this church, reach out and build relationships. If you want deeper friendships in your life, start reaching out to people get coffee once a week and be consistent. If you want a deeper relationship with God, Extend your quiet time. Just wake up a little earlier so you can get a little more time. Take personal action and see how the Lord's eyes are ranging and looking for that and the way he rewards it. Pray, good. Pray to God for deliverance. Involve him. I talked about this yesterday. I'll talk about it again today. I'll talk about it for the rest of my life. There's power in humbling yourself before God. There's power in putting yourself in a place of, I'm powerless to do this, but you have all the power to do you want this change, it'll change, and I know that. And there will be from the things you can be reliant on. For me, I've been able to rely on money. When my bank account starts hitting lower numbers, I, I can panic. Human wisdom, my own experiences, the things that I know and see, God does miracles. Politics, this was big for me. If you scroll back a couple years on my Facebook, you won't like what you're trying to say like that. It was bad. And people, this has been huge for me recently. I have felt a void from, from one place where I had invested nine years into relationships, had people that walked with me in my daily life, people I baptized, people I studied with, people I studied with, people I studied with other people with people. Disciple me, train me, build me up. And I'm, I'm now feeling that way, and in my panic, I'm reaching out for that and not necessarily reaching for God and reaching to be closer to God. And God has, through multiple people, now challenged me to be more aligned with These are mine. Take time this week, think about what yours are, and make a plan. To cut down those idols from your life and to remove those high places. Guys, if we can go all in for God, I think we can change this city. I think we can change this world. But 